Greetings. This is Rob Redden, and I happen to be the minister for the Grover Beach Church of Christ in the on the beautiful central coast of California. One of the best kept secrets. The weather is marvelous. Last few weeks, we have been talking about the existence of God and providing clear but convincing arguments for the existence of God. We talked about the moral argument, how that there has to be absolutes that exist separate and apart from my point of view, regardless of anybody's uh, point of view, there still are absolutes. And therefore, there must be a moral giver who provides those absolutes. We also talked about the origin of all things, how that there could not be an eternity of matter. The universe could not be eternal. If the universe was eternal, there couldn't be a concept of time. Because if you had no beginning, there's no ending either. And you can't just get off at a certain spot because there'd be no beginning or end. And, and so we said that everything that has a beginning has to have a cause, a cause big enough for that beginning. And nothing short of God could be the cause of all things. And then we talked about the design in the universe and showed that the meticulous design recognized by us all points to a designer, that ultimately everything is designed because there is a designer who is God. And so today I want to address the subject of beauty, that it speaks very loudly concerning the existence of God. Now, none of these arguments stand alone, but they're, they are accumulative in nature, which means when you pack them all together, it is very convincing. Now, my messages are not so philosophical that we can tackle a philosopher, atheist philosopher at a prestigious university. And neither of us, you nor I, will probably ever be faced with that situation. But we will, from time to time, face someone who says, I don't believe in God, but haven't really considered the evidence for God but basically are just parroting what mom and dad says or what some teacher in high school said. And so if we equip ourselves, we can give an answer for the hope that lies within us, as Peter asks us to do. Well, let's press on. Beauty and the existence of God. I like to title this, Look at the Lilies. Luke 12, 27, look at the lilies and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. If God can take care of the lilies of the field, how much more will he take care of us? But notice that God dressed them beautifully. And Jesus in this beautiful challenge is encouraging trust in God and his care. We should do well if we worried less and trusted more in God's care. See how the wild flower, flowers seem to flourish? They seem to push through cracks and walls or concrete. They seem to flourish even in dry ground. Succulents seem to thrive with little or no water. God provides, but there is more. 
God always gives evidence of his existence through the beauty of his creation. Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes 3.11, God made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. You know, we may differ as to what is beautiful, but we will all agree there is beauty. Some say beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, but there is beauty to see. And we believe that beauty is another fingerprint of God's existence. So let's look at the flowers dressed in beauty, says Jesus, and beyond these things. Isn't Jesus saying that they testify of a caring God? For Jesus, yes. Thus, we may extract from this evidence of God. You know, when Jesus says, look at the flowers, he implies the ability to see, and not only to see, but to perceive and to see color. You know, not all animals can see color. Some may see only parts of the color spectrum. Dogs, I've learned, are more colorblind than blind, colorblind. Pardon me, are more colorblind than only see black and white. They may be able to see certain wavelengths of color, but not much. The point I'm making is color is not necessary for survival. Animals do fine without that ability. So why color? It certainly is an added bonus of being alive. Although a black and white vision may seem unnatural, if that's all we had, we wouldn't know the difference, would we? Different shades of gray function very well. And we can even see beauty in that, in a Ansel Adams black and white photograph. You know, the colors of the rainbow are distinct. And Newton discovered how the rainbow is created by the refraction of white light onto the raindrops that serve as a prism that divides the electromagnetic waves into seven major colors. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo or violet, and blue. And so visible light comes in frequency and wavelengths of the light. And the more narrow the wavelength, the closer to red the color becomes. Our visible light falls within 400 and 700 nanometers. And don't try to count that, it'll be in the billions. Anything above or below these numbers is invisible, such as ultraviolet light and infrared radiation. Now, the human eye, as well as eyes in general, is one of the most amazing organs of animal life and human body, the human body in particular. It is capable of seeing a blend of all colors known to man. The largest box of Crayola crayons is 152 different colors. And this is a mixture of the seven basic colors to produce at least 152 colors. Of course, some of us folks, mostly men, <laughs> can't tell the difference between dark blue and black. You know, atheists cannot explain the reason why we can see color or even beauty for that matter. Well, just a few more mar remarks about the eye. How could anyone consider how remarkable the eye is without believing in God? The evolutionists tell us that all things evolve because of a need to survive. But how could a blindless creature evolve sight? If they are without sight, why would they need sight to survive? 
The fish in the mammoth caves are blind. So if you take them out of that and put it in light, you think that they would all of a sudden grow eyeballs? If no, if no creature saw anything, but evolved to see something, we have a problem. We're saying nature created the eye. So it happened that two eyes were evolved, and it so happens that these two eyes happen to be on a horizontal plane so that we not only can see, but that we have a range finder that determines distances. You know, more can be said about the eye. But I just wanted to add that our eyes provide us to see beauty at a distance or close up and all the colors of visible light. A marvelous blessing without any survival value at all. Animals that see only black, white, and shades of gray do just fine. Do you realize the blue sky is something unique to the earth? and is visible because of dust particles in the atmosphere. 17 miles above the earth, there's no dust, and the space is entirely black. So next time we complain about the dust, and the space is entirely black where there is no dust, and just remember when we're enjoying the blue skies due to the dust in the air. And add to this fact, there would be no rain if it weren't for dust. Dr. James Kennedy states, one drop of rain is made up of 8 million droplets of water, and each one of these droplets is wrapped around a tiny particle of dust. Without these, the world would become parched and life would cease to exist. You know, scientists can explain why there are beautiful sunsets or the color blue in the sky and can't explain the capacity to appreciate the beauty of a sunset or a blue sky or a flower or music or art or the laugh of a baby. And beauty is not something you can analyze under a microscope or in a petri dish in a lab. You see, evolution cannot solve the riddle of beauty, and God is the only explanation that makes sense. Darwin claimed in his Origin of the Species, some authors believe that many structures have been created for the sake of beauty or delight man or the creator or for the sake of mere variety. Such doctrines, if true, would be absolutely fatal to my theory. This is not a place to expose the fallacies of evolution. I hope to do that later. But beauty does not... Beauty does weaken the theory of evolution considerably. According to evolution, there is no purpose, no design, no plan. It's just the survival of the fittest, natural selection, and mutations that creates evolution. But beauty does not fit into these categories at all because beauty benefits others. It exists for others. According to Darwin, natural selection cannot possibly produce any modification in any one species exclusively for the good of another species. But natural selection can and does often produce structures for the direct injury of other species. In other words, evolution is cruel, selfish, a selfish, vicious journal, journey and care about nothing except the good of that species. 
In other words, evolution is cruel. A cruel, selfish journey. He conceded, though, if it could be proved that any part of the structure of any one species had been formed for the exclusive good of another species, it would annihilate my theory, for such could not have been produced through natural selection. Then he admits, I fully admit, that many structures are of no direct use to their possessors, which, uh, which includes the appreciation of beauty. His only explanation is that beauty, the features of beauty, were accidents of nature and that it must have had a survival value useful to the creatures in the past, but are not useful today. Thank you, Shakespeare. For the oft-quoted expression of a logical fallacy, the wish is the father to the thought. You know, many atheistic evolutionists are still stumped by human appreciation of beauty. They claim that it was needed for the survival of the species through sexual selection. In other words, the species chose the most beautiful to mate with. But Darwin pointed out that few species are attracted to beauty for mating purposes. And if it were so, think about this. Why haven't all the ugly creatures ceased to exist? I found on the internet a site of 2,614 ugliest animals. So after billions of years, according to their timeline, You'd expect these creatures would have become beautiful creatures and the ugly ones extinct. But such is not the case. And by the way, the blobfish has been crowned the ugliest animal. But you can search that for yourself and make your judgment based upon which one you would choose as the ugliest. We might add that we do see many shades of beauty and many shades of ugly. And there's a greater appreciation of beauty because of the presence of ugly. Adam and Eve may have been so conditioned by the beauty of the Garden of Eden that they took it for granted and wanted more. After all, there was no contrast. Everything was beautiful. And therefore, since there was nothing distracting about the Garden of Eden, and they had nothing to compare it to, their appreciation waned, their gratitude took a dip, and ultimately they wanted more. You know, what they wanted was something that was forbidden, and they thought it would be a better experience that of all the things provided for them, they must have thought that God held back as if they deserved it. We can also take beauty for granted. You can go to Yosemite and if you've gone there a few times, you may feel like you're just tagging along for your friend's benefit rather than yourself. I can't imagine that, but I have heard people become jaded to beauty and don't see it anymore. We're not only considering animal and human life, but beauty in the abstract. Abstract things like music, art, and nature. The perfect pitch of a Celine Dion, in contrast to one who cannot hit a note, or a Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel to the scribbling of a three-year-old? Why do we appreciate perfection in music and art? Why do we appreciate beauty in the first place? It is not essential to life or survival. It isn't even essential to happiness. A blind person has no appreciation of visible beauty, but can learn to be content and happy with what they have. 
what happens is the blind person's other senses often become enhanced. And the touch and hearing and taste of things bring an awareness of beauty that you and I may not even grasp. Isn't this amazing? And this isn't only true of humankind, but animals as well. Personally, in our own experience, our dog Angel became deaf at four years of age and lived another 10 years. And her sight and sensation were amazing. She, act, act, she could tell when a car would drive by or drive up the driveway, obviously feeling the vibrations of a car. She could not hear. She was totally deaf. But she could tell us if there was a car nearby. Blind evolution cannot explain the appreciation of beauty, much less the enhancement of the senses through the loss of a sense. So the question comes to mind, why does beauty exist anyway? When God created all things, he said it was good. This Hebrew word tov occurs around 300 times in the Hebrew Bible and is often translated beauty. And that could be the partial meaning of this word good here in Genesis 1. And it was good. It was beautiful. Only after the fall was ugly introduced to the world through sin. You know, the Hebrew language is in the Old Testament is rich with words of beauty. I've counted at least 20 different words to describe it. In the New Testament, we have less than five Greek words for beauty. Of course, it may be the result of a smaller collection of writings that explains this difference. But God is concerned about beauty. When God created man and woman, he put them in the most beautiful garden that ever existed. We can't imagine such perfection. Obviously, God wanted the best for the couple, and his beauty was for their comfort, enjoyment, and also to help them to learn gratitude. We don't know how long they lived in this in that pristine, beautiful garden before they sin. But I want to pick up on what I said earlier. If you have nothing to compare beauty to, that beauty will not make a lasting impression and you ultimately take it for granted. And you often fail to see the beauty that is there. And they began taking it for granted. And they started taking God for granted. They became ungrateful for what they had and wanted something that they didn't have, something God held back from them. Satan waited for the opportune moment to spring a trap on them when their ingratitude and pride began to take over them, which became their downfall. And Adam didn't put up any resistance whatsoever. My point is this. Many see God's beauty every day and don't give it a thought. It has little impact upon them. But can you imagine a blind person being blind for 30 years, receiving his sight? Oh, what beauty he beholds. How appreciative of the different colors that exist. Now, look at Paul's statement to the people at Lystra a city in present-day Turkey. Acts 14, 16 through 17. He said, In the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways. And yet he did not leave himself without witness, in that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. God's gift of the beauty of the seasons are witnesses of his very existence and his godly care. How can we not see the handiwork of a living God who has given us all things to enjoy? All things to enjoy is a biblical expression. 
In 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good and to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may be ta may take hold of that which is life indeed. You see, God created the beauty in this world to witness his existence and his loving care and his desire for our joy and happiness. Paul claims that God's kindness and goodness are visible. He said in Romans 2, 4, Do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? The beauty of God's long-suffering, his patience and his mercy and grace are incomparable. Yet all this and more demand our repentance. When someone has something bad happen to them, they often say, why did this happen to me? You know, God could easily say, why not? You're a sinner and you deserve worse. But just maybe God is giving us a wake-up call because his goodness hasn't been received with repentance. We have a song, count your many blessings, name them one by one. Have you tried that? I'm sure you won't have a short list. But if you do, you have not seen the kindness of God. You know, I want to carry this thought a little farther. Further, if you prefer. After Jesus healed a lame man, he found him in the temple courts. Listen to what Jesus told him. John 5, 14. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and he said to him, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. You know, a worse thing can happen to any of us. And in time, very probable. But the worst thing of all is to enjoy the blessings of God, his, its beauty, all his gifts, and spurn the God who gave, him, gave them. Whenever we enjoy God's creation as Adam and Eve did, we must acknowledge his existence and his kindness and realize sin drives us away from God as Adam and Eve were driven out of the pristine garden. I've got a long quote from Alexander Solzhenitsyn. It comes from his Nobel Prize lecture, and he reflected these words. And so perhaps that old trinity of truth and good and beauty is not just the formal outworn formula it used to seem to us during our heady materialistic youth. If the crests of these three trees join together, as the investigators and explorers used to affirm, and if the too obvious, too straight branches of truth and good are crushed and amputated and cannot reach the light, yet perhaps the whimsical, unpredictable, expect, expected, unexpected branches of beauty will make their way through and soar to that very place and in this way perform the work of all three. And in that case, it was not a slip of the tongue for Dostoevsky to say that beauty will save the world, but a prophecy. Yes, some things may not reach the top, but beauty, if given its rightful place, will lead us to truth and goodness. Oh, yes, an atheist may say, 
How can you believe in God with all the evil in the world? The Christian can respond, How can you not believe in God for all the good in the world? You know, in an atheistic world, there would only be savagery, slavery, and oppression. There would be no compassion for the weak, since the weak hinder the evolution of a species, of a more intelligent, powerful, superhuman being. It would be the law of the jungle. But God exists, and his goodness is witness. It is witnessed in all the things that he has made, the beauty of creation, the goodness of that we see, and this will lead us to follow the life of Jesus, the most beautiful life that ever lived, the Son of God. You know, we must be good stewards of the earth, and I'm in agreement with that, but we must also be good stewards of the souls that belong to God. The beauty of creation cries out, I am the maker of heaven and earth, and I am reaching out to you to bring your life into conformity to my son's character so that you will have a better life here and a perfect life hereafter. Will you not see how important, how God is leading you through his goodness and kindness to become a Christian? Let's pray. Dear God, how beautiful you are. How beautiful is your Son. How beautiful are your teachings that touch our hearts. How beautiful is the creation of all the good things in this world that far outweigh the curse to remind us that you still care for your children. You still care that they have happiness in spite of the curse on this world. And we pray, dear Lord, that we will become a more grateful people, appreciative of your thumbprint on this world in all its beauty, pointing to you, O oh God, and help us to try to live that beautiful life that we see in Jesus. For it is in his name we pray. Amen. I want to thank you for your kindness to listen to this broadcast. We hope that you would invite your friends, your neighbors, and relatives to tune in to this, either on YouTube or our webpage, GroverBeachChurchChrist.com, where you'll find all the past uh, recordings of my sermons for the last four years. And we will continue doing this as long as there's interest and it is my prayer that God will bless you and keep you until we meet again. Goodbye.